Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I am your host, Scott Ramp. I'm here to usher you in to the weekend of March 12th, 13th, and the 14th, uh, Friday. Um, I'm taping this on Thursday, so a lot of the news that might be breaking on Friday you won't hear about. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about what's happening this week. We move past, uh, we move into a new phase of COVID relief this week uh, with the $1.9 trillion passage of the American uh Relief Act, uh, as something interesting in regarding uh, children relief care for them, and this is uh, this is called the Child Tax Credit, which is a part of this uh, relief bill, which is going to provide three hundred dollars uh, per month for folks who are in low income, single parents making more than seventy five thousand, and couples making more than one hundred fifty thousand would not be eligible for this. So far, this is temporary and will. Uh, Debate future funding later down the line for the children tax credit. Unemployment benefits will continue uh, at $300 a week. Uh, the fight to open schools and help local communities and states. Uh, $130 billion for schools, which include funding for colleges, food assistance, child care, health insurance, in the Affordable Care Act expansion. Um, the Equity Act is also something that's picking up a little steam. It is basically to expand the ban on, discri on uh, discrimination based on LGBTQ, uh, sexual orientation, and gender identity. And part of this is that um, with the, basically it gives a more legal precedence, precedence for people of the LGBTQ community to basically dispute claims of discrimination uh, from employers, uh, housing, and you name it, basically. It's uh, just a way for people to uh, basically be like, you can't deny me a loan based on my gender identity, that kind of deal. So far, uh, many smaller communities like Missoula created their non-discrimination ordinance that didn't have enough teeth in the legal department, but as the ordinance, it would have a fine for people, but it didn't necessarily... Um, go any further than that. Many faith-based schools and communities are concerned that this would affect any kind of federal funding and federal grants that they may get. Part of this has to do with uh, strict moral codes in their schools that separate gender based on housing, and uh, they have no way of accommodating transgender individuals. Um, I guess whatever the gender they say they are, put them in that housing, but you know that that's not a third option. Um, so far, these would open some of these uh, religious schools to some more lawsuits in the future, but in many religious groups, changes in how folks define sex and marriage have become more tolerant in the last few years solely based on the idea that everyone should have the fair shot at love, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Another big bill, which is kind of being overshadowed by a lot of these, is the uh, PRO Act. Uh, if you don't know what the PRO Act is, it is in the last, uh, basically in the last 30 years, um, unions have kind of been ignored and workers' rights has been kind of been uh, slowly stripped away. But with this new PRO Act, it's basically giving power and more um, ability to protect uh, the formation of unions. If you're, at, if you're striking, uh, the, uh, the Hill, uh, another uh, news outlet, gave a great example. Imagine you work at a grocery store and the employees decide to strike. And in solidarity, the Teamsters, the ones who uh, bring the uh, chain of supply to those grocery stores, can also do a strike with them. Uh, in a lot of ways, a lot of grocery stores could have temporary workers come in to kind of relieve their job, but are not allowed to uh, have permanent replacements within this PRO Act. So basically, nobody will take your job, but they have to figure out a negotiation moving forward. Unions are becoming more and more popular and necessary, especially in the world of Amazon. If you have seen a bunch of the stories about there's Amazon warehouses and a lot of people being kind of um, uh, jerked around in a way, uh, there's just a lot of stories on that. You guys can look that up yourself. Uh, you know, it's, it is a $15 uh, minimum wage that they start off on, but they uh, a lot of workers are forced to wa walk miles a day uh, to. Uh, uh, ship and box things for you guys to be delivered at your door. Uh, another big need for unions would uh, be the meatpacking industry. It preys on vulnerable populations that are either in pre-release or undocumented, uh, undocumented migrant workers. So here are the basically the big things, the big uh, five things, provisions, part of the PRO Act is that union dues from workers who chose to opt out before can get collected uh, further on to help benefit the unions moving forward and f benefit from wage negotiations. Companies can force workers to meet, to, uh, can't force workers to meet to vote. So in a lot of ways, you know, you can, uh, uh, 
a company can't basically be like have a force meeting and be like, I heard you guys were going to start a union, but you know, uh, I think that's not a good idea. We support you. You don't need to unionize. And I also allow them to cast any kind of votes for their future outside of their company. So there's a lot of stuff with that right there. There's interesting things how a lot of companies have kind of dissuade the formation of unions. Uh, when at first you don't succeed, the product uh, pr uh, protects the right to continue negotiations to seek arbitration and mediation. So a lot of times the unions that are very successful in forming don't come to a, an agreement the first time, or, uh, the first round with companies. Um, number four, the law would prevent any employer from using his employee's immigration status against them when determining the terms of their employment. So some people who are on a work visa who need to have a job, that, that, that allows them a little more protection, but also migrant workers as well. Penalty, uh, penalties to company who violate any of those uh, um, deal, any of those rights. This would also help gig workers like Uber to unionize as well. This is interesting time because there's a lot of uh, need for workers and even from anecdotal evidence from my own circle is uh, there's a lot of um, issues with getting a job, not necessarily on the employee, but a lot of it has to do with the employer. All right, um, let's talk about some MCAT. So if you haven't heard on the radio and the news, uh, the, the library does hope to open. Um, and the, the plan is to, once everyone in the library staff, including MCAT, uh, under one roof uh, organizations like uh, Families First and the Spectrum uh, Living Lab, once they get all their vaccinations of the people who uh, work there, um, including MCAT, um, they'll be opening up to uh, the public. I mean, that's, that's the whole plan and moving forward on that. Uh, one of the things I just got the email about this is that they do want to curve the flow of people coming in. Um, one of the things that they originally planned was to kind of masks, of course. You know, you have to wear a mask when you're in the building. Um, uh, there have waypoints, so arrows to point in which ways you can go down the aisle. You can't, you know, like, go back. If you've... Uh, if, uh, if you, from what I've seen in the library, a lot of the book aisles are kind of like a one-way kind of deal anyways. It's kind of really hard to walk down and have another person walk the other way towards you. So they probably have a little more waypoints, much how a couple of grocery stores in Missoula has done uh, uh, as well. Uh, another thing is the special hour, uh, hours for high-risk populations. Um, usually like a senior hours that they did with a couple of the grocery stores back in the early days of the pandemic. Uh, meeting rooms and uh, more uh, gathering areas will be off limits. So um, the library will continue to offer curbside pickup for six days a week. And you can return our books via the drop off on the east side of the building. There's a uh, machine that basically takes your books for you. It's pretty great. Uh, that's kind of what's going on there. Uh, Zach has a show up this weekend. It is a comedy show, so there's going to be some stand-up comedy this weekend. Last weekend, we got some Mudslide Charlie, and I was really impressed about the uh, audio quality of this band. So uh, without further ado, here is a little taste of the performance that happened last Saturday. This next time is called uh, Mercenary Man, and it was written in, uh, in the middle of all that claustrophobic craziness that we just went through. Uh, watching the nation explode, people trapped in isolation, reading all the news of all the breakdown and the disunion and the separation, and, and uh, hard to get away from it. So we thought we'd turn it into a song. It's called Mercenary Man. Listen. 
ordinary mail It's either slam divided Got to find a way to make more you know a deal It's ordinary mail Well, we ain't that more different Got to find a way to make more you know Gentlemen. Hey guys, welcome back. And now it's time for Pre Critic, where I prejudge a movie based on absolutely nothing. We got a Bruce Willis movie, folks. Woo woo, Bruce Willis, woo woo. Um, <laughs> so, anyways, it's called Cosmic Sin. So, it's a sci fi movie, and it has to do with the fact that it there's things happening. Um, but honestly, since when did Bruce Willis do uh, sci-fi original asylum type movies? Although this is probably a bigger budget, but still kind of feels like that. This is not one of them. Let's look at the evidence. Cosmic Sin. A uh, movie about space religion. Perhaps Bruce Willis's character is a retired badass uh, uh, who puts uh, into who gets pulled into a conflict that he's reluctant to be a part of, much like his M.O. Um, anyways, this is a big... The, the Watch this movie, movie acti action star Frank Grillo, who has basically kind of gotten popular into Marvel movie, but kind of dipped into a lot of international markets as kind of like the face of that guy. I was like, hmm, that guy again. Cool. Uh, anyways, he, he's going to play a, a mercenary with the heart of poop. 
already said ass once on on this show. Anyways, this is um, it's like you'd expect from space aliens attacking humans, and we invade alien planets to get their space petroleum. They do a spaceport harbor on us, and we have to fight them aliens. All right, that's basically the movie Cosmic Sin come true. Um, in the in the vein of those movies where you basically have a phrase and then you take a snippet of that phrase, um, be careful what you wish for. Or uh, this is more of the concept of it's like uh, it's a dream come true. So the movie's called Come True, and part of this is a sense of dreams uh, redacted come true when a girl suffering from nightmares goes into a university sleep study where reality and dreams become begin to blur either for the her or the world around her. Basically, you can expect this movie to basically um, be very confusing and then you realize that maybe you were in a dream the whole time. I don't know. It's kind of like one of those things where it's just like, oh, I can't. The dreams, the nightmares are awful. It was like, you were in a dream the whole time. Pulls out, pulls off face and there's a monster and these blah, 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 blah. And then later on it's like she's in a coma the whole time. I don't know. That's kind of what I'm feeling like this or maybe like it's also sci-fi in a way where it's like um, her dreams actually become reality and start killing people. I don't know. Anyways, we have another uh, uh, media platform from video games. It's Monster Energy Supercross 4. Um, it, from a corporate tie-in game comes Motocross. Uh, this is called Monster Energy Supercross 4. Um, AMA Supercross 4, it's a game about motocross and you basically race around, you jump on hills and stuff like that. People really do like motocross, but you can play the games, um, you can play it on the new PlayStation console if you can even get it. Um, enjoy graphics and yet another run of the mill racing game where you jump over dirt mounds and race other people online. Racing games are for a select group of people and some people really get good at it, but with a super sponsored game. All right, so that about does it for my pre-critic uh, section of my show. Up next, we got a new dub and stuff called Hot Rod Girl. And uh, disclaimer, uh, it's not the girl who drives the hot rod. Hmm, I think he's trying to cut us off. What do you think? Should we cut him off first? Oh, wow, well, uh, I don't know if we should. <laughs> I'm here. Prepare to be cut off. Oh, yes, I'm talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, Charlie. I got this. Go away! Oh. I guess it worked. Hmm, that's nice. Heh <laughs> <laughs> bet you can't dodge this. Boo. Oh jeez, I'm gonna get him! Oh no, 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 that's not the time to do this. <laughs> oh, uh, watch me do it again. I swear if he does it again. Calm down. I'm gonna freak out. <laughs> Watch out. Slowly again. Oh man, he's just asking for it, isn't he? <laughs> just what do you expect to happen when you catch him? Yeah, what do you expect to happen when you catch him? I'm afraid me? he might sass us. Oh yeah, I'm gonna sass you all right. You see, I told you. It's just not worth it anymore. And you were right. It wasn't worth it. I'm only looking out for you. <laughs> Man, how did I get so old? All these years flashed by so quickly. I shouldn't have smoked all those cigarettes. Well, it's, uh, sometimes it's always jeans, too. You can't always expect it to be just the cigarettes. This is the 50s, after all, so they're healthy for you. Not saying I condone the smoking of cigarettes. Just looking at me makes me the poster child of not smoking. Man, how did it get this way? We used to drag race when we were younger. But now what are we doing? We're just standing around. <laughs> well, it's not that bad, is it? I guess not. Hey, did you hear about the story about the man from Nantucket? Hold that thought. I gotta go pick up the phone. Yeah, what do you want? Oh, really? You don't say. Y you don't say. You don't say. Oh, really? I'm not falling for this again. Don't you want to know what he said? You will regret it. I know it. What did he say? He didn't say. Let's go. Harumph.
Hello everyone, we are back and it's time for a little bit of that city council. I have a lot more to talk about with city council, but we're going to kick things off with the official city council meeting that happened on Monday. Uh, public transit has been going through some tough times during this pandemic and Mayor John Ang gives a proclamation for Missoula's uh, mountain line transit system. Whereas public transit benefits uh, benefits us all in Missoula by reducing traffic and parking congestion, improving air quality, and making our city more equitable and accessible to all. And whereas public transit operators fill an important role in our community by getting people where they need to go, from work, uh, from work and school to medical appointments, grocery stores, and other essential services. And whereas public transit operators frequently go above and beyond the call of duty, working long hours and safely operating our transit system in rain, snow, extreme cold, wind, and during a global pandemic. And whereas public transit operators help to build our community by knowing their passengers, celebrating their successes, aiding in times of crisis, and greeting them every day with friendly faces. Pardon me. And whereas Mountain Line and ASUM Transportation provide essential services to our community at zero fare for the benefit of all residents and visitors of Missoula. Now, therefore, I, John Ingen, Mayor of the City of Missoula in the state of Montana, hereby recognize the 18th day of March uh, 2021 as Transit Operator Appreciation Day. Give your bus drivers a solid nod. This March 18th, Shancy Johnson out of Mountain Line uh, responds to this proclamation. Um, and I just want to thank you all so much for your support over the past year for recognizing our team for the essential service that they play, um, that they provide in our community and the essential role that public transit plays to keeping all of us healthy and connected, particularly during difficult times, but even in normal times. So thank you so much for your recognition today. This means a lot to our staff and our team and we really appreciate it. Short and sweet, March kicks off the beginning of Women's History Month and the mayor speaks on this as well during the proclamation. The month of March is Women's History Month, which celebrates significant contributions of women of all races, ethnicities, and backgrounds. Uh, and the contributions they've made to the world. And whereas women play a critical role in the vitality and diversity of our communities and are essential to ensuring Montana is well represented. And whereas while the 20th century was a pivotal time of growth for women entering politics, women remain un underrepresented in male dominated fields and thus providing opportunities to support women in public office is imperative. And whereas recognizing women in public office will bring awareness to the fundamental necessity of their work and will inspire other young women to serve their communities. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the mayor of the city of Missoula and the Missoula City Council, the March 19th, 2021, hereby be proclaimed celebrating women in public office day and call upon the people of Missoula and Montana to unite as we support the success of women in public office and observe every March 19th with appropriate activities, events, and programs. So the city of Missoula in recent years has included a majority of female leaders in the city council with a majority of eight out of 12 city council members are female. As of October 2019, if you Google this, about 25% of na national level politicians are women. Women also make up 51% of the U.S. and about 20% of the U.S. politics from local, state, and national statistics, but I'm also lowballing it, uh, but not by much. Um, another big thing happening in Missoula is the population, but with a new census coming out, the city of Missoula looked to change the ward boundaries. Uh, Neil uh, Pinneman talks about the boundaries. So over these two years, 1,013 housing units have been added to the city, and development has occurred throughout the city, though it hasn't been equally distributed. So this map represents the new population that has been added according to building permits. Um, but it's important to remember that not every, um, that, that the wards weren't completely equal before these, uh, all of these new dwelling units were added. So the blue dots are single, single dwellings, the duplexes are yellow, and multi-dwellings are in red with larger dots representing larger multi-dwelling developments. As I said before in my uh, previous reports, the larger developments are occurring in Ward 2 and have to change. Most areas that are on the border of the wards will see some major changes moving forward. Like I said, uh, wards and populations, the average uh, wards, they don't want it to uh, dip any lower than uh, 
12,500 people, but not higher than 14,000 people per ward in the city of Missoula. The average is about uh, 13,500 is what they're trying to reach, give or take amount of people. And so they try to uh, adjust the ward boundaries. And uh, Neil Pinneman uh, brings up the wards that need more people. And like I said, Ward 2 has the most. So these are the estimated ward populations at the current time. Wards 1 and 6 are in alignment within that 3%. Wards two and five are over, and wards three and four are under. And as you can see from things uh, are gonna change, and this presentation is about what the city can do to adjust the growth in Missoula um, and just adjust the uh, boundaries as well. So uh, Neil gives, another, uh, gives an example of the changes. So this first change, um, ward three is expanding and ward four contracting, moving the shared boundary between these wards from uh, south in the University District from Woodward Avenue to North Avenue. So the old boundaries are shown with the black line here, and the new boundary is the, the outline of the, the, the lighter color with the outline of the same, same color of the ward that it's being moved to. So the, this, these blocks here are moving from Ward 4 into Ward 3. And without getting into more detail about this, I'm just going to kind of go through this uh, quickly to kind of tell you guys what is going to change. Um, ward 4 expanded to Ward 5, west of Paxton and Eaton Street, Schilling and Door. Ward 5 will follow from North Dearborn Street to uh, South Avenue in Ward 6. Ward 6 will take me, will be taking some of the area in Ward 2, more in the Mullen Road kind of area. And that new development that's kind of being developed, they're going to be kind of pushing more of that Ward 6 up there. Originally, you know, Mullen Road was kind of like the cross between uh, Ward 6 and Ward 2. But as Ward 2 keeps on expanding and having more units and more housing, it looks like Ward 6 is going to start creeping up on Ward 2 just a little bit more. Um, here is Neil once again, and he reflects on this. These are conservative uh, changes where not a large number of population is moving from one ward to another. Uh, and these are continuations of previous changes that have been made. So um, we're not moving um, ward district boundaries back and forth so much as continuing trends that have, have occurred in the past. And to what extent was possible uh, neighborhood association boundary, council boundaries were, were kept intact and where there were splits before, there may still be splits, but we're not adding any new uh, splitting or confusion into that. And so far, you know, these are just kind of like uh, ward boundary growth based on development. Uh, the public hearing will be open until March 22nd. Uh, so far, the elections office will make changes to which residents vote for who in upcoming elections and will affect some people and their and who the representatives are in the city. So basically, ward boundaries only really affect who you vote for in the elections. There's no like specialty ward tax. And if they do any kind of impact fees or any kind of deal, that's usually based on the neighborhood and it's usually nothing to do with the ward you live in. The city of Missoula is looking to create trails and green space in the Mullen area, 44 Ranch, George Elmer Drive. Um, there's a lot of area near Hellgate Elementary that was previously agricultural farmland that they're uh, basically converting into more housing developments and also throughways for roads. England Boulevard is going to get an ex expansion. This this is War Two, and it's uh, basically the beginning of a lot of brand new neighborhoods that are getting built. And Jordan Hess is talking about this area. In addition to the parkland requirement, the developer must meet the activity area requirements that are set forth in Title 20, our zoning code, um, for the areas that are east of George Elmer Drive, which means that we're ensuring that, that, um, that those activity areas get met. And that usually means that, that anywhere from, from 13 to 20% of these parcels will be comprised of green space for the benefit of the residents in addition to the standard landscaping requirements. Um, so, you know, we've heard some comments that there's going to be a dearth of green space. And I, I really think that this is, multifamily buildings are dense, but they don't have to be unlivable. They, they can be nice places to live. And our, our, our requirements um, provide for activity area and they provide for landscaping and, uh, and, and landscaped green spaces. And so I'm really leaning on our requirements here um, to, um, to require good development. Um, these are going to be brand new neighborhoods with characters and the time we live in reflects the mass exodus that is coming to Missoula. 
Exodus might be pushing it a little bit, but prices are going up and things are getting more scarce for folks buying homes in town. Uh, Jordan hopes that neighborhoods that already exist will understand that this development is for the intention of the 30-year plan of this area and has nothing to do with the, the rapid expansion and the rapid need for housing and affordable housing in Missoula because this is part of that longer plan of developing in that northern part of 44 Ranch, uh, Heron Landing and whatnot. The rezoning of this area will also create a buffer from future developments will also rely on community input in the long run. There's not much community input when it comes to development uh, just in general because a lot of times the, the developers look for a plot of land and they build whatever they kind of want. And, since, and a lot of times if there's a new neighborhood that's gonna be built, they kind of just build it. Um, I mean, there's not much uh, a city or county can really say um, about what's being built, but they do have a, a through point that they do have to meet up with city and potentially county, if it is in the county, uh, to talk about what they're going to plan. And rezoning allows for more insight for the city of Missoula to do that, which a lot of times the city of Missoula can't necessarily leverage a lot of development what's happening, uh, but they can do it in certain circumstances. And this is not necessarily one of them. But the rezoning will help basically uh, kind of mitigate um, uh, to just residential slash commercial and not just have uh, industrial commercial properties. So that's kind of what rezoning kind of does to prevent that kind of stuff from happening. Anyways, uh, they did open it for public comment. And this is Kevin Hunt from Up the Rattlesnake. And this is what he had to say about uh, rezoning and uh, some of the development that's happening. It isn't just that we have a housing problem. It's that... It's that anticipations of what may happen have become self-fulfilling prophecy. And we are uh, building a new Missoula for people moving here from out of state who can afford to buy whatever they want. And we're, we're displacing people from their homes who have been here a long time who can't afford the property taxes. And you can understand uh, from uh, Mr. Hunt's concern is that Missoula is growing. And and he sees the potential fallout from selling ag agricultural lands uh, for filling the housing needs. Uh, I've covered the planning board during the, some of these meetings, and one of the biggest staple is that uh, protecting the agricultural lands and creating not necessarily just a green space, but also potential for land that will uh, improve and being able to have future egg ag potential, agricultural potential that may not exist in the future. Uh, the city voted to rezone the Heron area up to 44 Ranch, to move forward in this package. Uh, expect housing to supply in to increase in Missoula. And so far, Missoula is acquiring open space land. So they did re, uh, re uh, basically a reply to what he was saying. They're saying that uh, the city of Missoula has been uh, buying open space uh, um, and for the purposes as of maintaining and sustaining our natural landscape. So that's kind of like what the city has been doing. Um, the open space bond, which was back in 2006, has been helping to prevent any kind of development, housing kind of big kind of thing. So we're not just completely surrounded by houses and there's some natural land for us to watch. There's a lot to talk about and that's kind of where we're at on that. Um, I did look over a couple committee meetings. I didn't have any clips I'm going to provide for you guys. So I'm going to try to uh, bulldoze my way through this and committee, committee of the whole met Wednesday to talk about the emergency winter shelter. And so the emergency winter shelter was kind of established back in 2018, 2019 winter season when a community outcry were really concerned about people who were freezing to death in the winter who uh, don't have homes. And the POV uh, also have been kind of spearheading this uh, ever since uh, to uh, utilize both uh, the Pavarel Center, Johnson Street's um, shelter, as well as utilizing the uh, Salvation Army, which opened up their doors in the first season. And the Pavarel Center has, and their staff has been basically kind of coordinating this. And with the COVID making it even harder, but one of the big things about the COVID thing is that the money was provided for our community to kind of keep these going on. So the winter warming shelter will end the end of March. And the funding also will continue for, from the CARES Act, which is something that passed a long time ago. And a lot of communities already lost. But in Missoula, we've been able to really stretch that out for quite some time. Uh, it's interesting that we're still talking about money from the CARES Act even now as the new relief uh, just passed for unemployment.
But the part of this is that they're going to be continuing the emergency winter shelter in April, but specifically only for overnight and not for long-term residents. Uh, so they're going to have the option for people to uh, stay warm during uh, those April, uh, the April month where overnight could drop down pretty cold and we might because usually we do have a cold snap and so that will help continue that but right now the emergency delta will end officially in their money and funding on march 31st but we'll offer overnight assistance until april um they did spoke they did speak in support of possibly expanding this but they would have to draft something uh later down the line for being able to expand this as well but the city funded a good portion of this and some grant funding as well but the CARES Act really helped put this over the put this over the edge if I'm trying to think of a good metaphor for this but just to help moving this forward as well all right so one of the things that happened in COVID times as well was the death of George Floyd and one of the things that uh, the city of Missoula and the city, a lot of the citizens came in to complain about just the uh, the hammer approach when it comes to working with citizens who have uh, mental disability issues um, and who have a mental uh, health crisis. Um, they talk a little bit more about the mobile crisis unit and uh, is doing in Missoula with expanded hours going from uh, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. daily to help those who are having a mental health crisis. The biggest part of this crisis unit was a result of the national attention uh, because of uh, the death of George Floyd. Um, they divine the, the, with the demand of softer police presence in the behavioral health crisis that police are not trained for. Uh, part of this would uh, alleviate police time and allow trained professionals to work with uh, folks in wellness checks and do follow-ups and that kind of stuff. A lot of times uh, police are called in to uh, control the situation, but when people are certainly having mental health crises, a lot of times um, controlling them isn't the best option figuring out a way to kind of work with them. And that's what this mobile health crisis unit does. And a lot of people who have those crises uh, beyond those hours, they touch base with them after the fact and kind of work with them to kind of see the kind of help. And this is in partnership with Partnership uh, Healthcare. And um, there's just a lot of stuff going on there as well. And so far the biggest challenges are staffing. Uh, this is money that's to a new system and they're working on this moving forward. Uh, the system-wide challenges and the responder education is another big thing, but this is a new uh, project and they're looking to continue this uh, based on how much funding they have. All right, uh, Public Works. Um, this is a very interesting kind of deal. I do have pictures for this uh, that I'm going to be showing you guys as well, is that uh, Missoula is looking to kind of improve the road from East Broadway when it becomes Highway 200. That's a big corridor that connects Missoula to East Missoula, which is a whole other community, uh, and it has its own community um, uh, liaisons there as well. It's considered like its own town, just so you know. Um, it's not just Eastern Missoula, it's East Missoula. All right, enough background explanation. The whole point of this is they want to create more sidewalks, boulevards, and whatnot like that. Here's a picture. Um, the idea they, they want to build are wider lanes and trails to accommodate. Um, and also in this picture, you see they kind of have ideas for the bike lanes. Um, usually it was just a road with painted lines for the bike lanes and people walking. And it wasn't much safe uh, because if you remember... Uh, 10 years ago, there were an accident with uh, four teenagers who were walking down that road. Uh, two of them were hit and killed, and the other two were injured. And um, one of the things that they want to do is help improve it by having more boulevards. So there's a buffer between the highway uh, road and the sidewalk itself. Um, and a big part of this road uh, change is to widen the underpass below the railroad tracks as you make your way to East Missoula. Once the big, once kind of like that's like kind of like the gateway to actually get in East Missoula is growing right underneath the railroad tracks um, to uh, from Broadway to, through uh, Highway 200. Okay, so there are a lot of foam and apartments in those areas as well. So this will make uh, travel and biking ideal for a lot of those uh, people living in those neighborhoods moving forward. Anyways, I kind of gloss over a lot of things. And if you want more information, you can go to ci.missoula.mt.us. It is a wonderful resources for how do you get involved with the city of Missoula. It has permitting um, and you can look at future development and agenda items as well as past minutes from meetings and more. It's all uh, available and video provided by MCAT. Movie, um, and that's it.
All right, so um, I do have your latest COVID report, and most of the COVID reports from Cindy Farr and the uh, Missoula City County Health Department has to do with vaccines. So it's nice to know kind of what's going on there, and they give uh, and they give a weekly update on what's going on and what phase we're at in the city of Missoula. So without further ado, here's this. Hi, my name is Cindy Farr and I'm the Incident Commander for the Missoula City County Health Department's COVID-19 response. Today is Thursday, March 4th, and this is our COVID briefing. We've now had 8,300, sorry, let me start that over. We've had 8,230 cumulative positive cases in Missoula County to date with 10 new cases since yesterday. We've had 82 deaths associated with COVID-19. We currently have 107 active COVID-19 cases, and we have two Missoula County residents and two out-of-county residents currently hospitalized in Missoula County. Our current average incidence per 100,000 people has now dropped down to 11. The state of Montana is reporting 100,531 cumulative COVID cases, which is up 181 new cases since yesterday. There are now 1,657 active cases with 73 hospitalizations across the state, and there have been 1,375 deaths related to COVID-19 statewide. The University of Montana has had 672 cumulative UM-associated cases since the beginning of fall semester back in August, with one new case reported since yesterday, and there are currently 12 active UM-associated cases. The state only updates our vaccination data once a week on Monday, so the numbers have not changed since my last report. To date, there have been 29,566 doses of COVID vaccine administered in Missoula County, with 11,319 people having received both the first and second dose of the vaccine. We're now seeing an increase in the amount of vaccine coming into the county. We're still receiving allocations from the state of approximately 1,500 doses per week, but we're now also receiving federal allocations to some local pharmacies, as well as to the to Partnership Health Center, which is our federally qualified health center here in Missoula. So today I'm gonna to talk about vaccine phases and where we now are, um, vaccine appointments and COVID variants that have now been identified in Montana. As of today, we've been able to officially move to opening up vaccination appointments to everyone who fits in the 1B phase. This includes people age 70 and over, Native Americans and people of color, people age 16 to 69 with certain qualifying health conditions. Those qualifying health conditions are cancer, which includes anyone who has had any type of cancer, even if you're in remission, um, chronic kidney disease, COPD, Down syndrome, heart conditions such as heart failure, coronary artery disease, or cardiomyopathies, weakened immune system from solid organ transplant, and severe obesity defined as having a BMI equal or greater, to, equal or greater than 40, sickle cell disease, and type 1 or type 2 diabetes. This decision was made because appointment booking slowed significantly this week. This did take place much sooner than we were expecting as we thought it might actually be mid-March before we were able to fully open 1B. We estimated 16,500 people would qualify in tier one of phase 1B. Um, and our current data indicates that roughly 8,200 people actually got vaccinated while phase 1B tier one was open. We are doing our best to make data-driven decisions as to when the next phase and tiers will open and used the census data to help us determine how many people would be in each phase and each tier. Next, I wanna talk a little bit about appointments. We are working really hard to spread the word about our vaccine appointment announcements, but we would appreciate it if you could reach out to your family, friends, and neighbors who may be struggling to find vaccine information. The local news has reported on our clinics we make social media announcements, we have announcements on the radio and in the newspapers, but some people are still struggling to find these announcements. So if you have a neighbor, friend, or family member who may not have internet access or may not be as socially connected, please check on them and see if they need help finding information on vaccines. And again, I wanna direct you to covid19.missoula.co. That's the webpage where you can find the most comprehensive information about where you might be able to get a vaccination appointment. 
So we are starting to see a lot of national reports about vaccine guilt. Some people may feel guilty that their race, ethnicity, or their BMI help them qualify for a vaccine, and they aren't getting vaccinated because they worry that there are more qualified people out there that need the vaccine more. We want to assure everyone that there is absolutely no reason to feel guilty if you qualify for a vaccine. We want to encourage everyone to take the vaccine once they qualify. Getting vaccinated is in no way selfish, and by getting vaccinated, you're helping our community as a whole because you're contributing to our herd immunity. Um, both infectious disease experts and dietitians agree that it's very important for people who may be struggling with obesity to get their COVID vaccination as soon as you're eligible for it. Vaccine supplies are increasing, so don't feel like you took a vaccine from a more deserving person by getting it. In the coming months, we are going to have enough vaccine nationwide to vaccinate anyone who wants it. Last, I want to let you know that the state health department confirmed with us that there are now three cases of UK variants that have been identified in Gallatin County. DPHHS says that these all occurred in younger people and those younger people who, who contracted it recovered just fine. Um, this is a variant that is more contagious than the strain of COVID-19 that we've been seeing up until now. We want to remind everyone that masks and social distancing are still really important. If the variant is popping up in Gallatin County, there's a good chance that it could end up in Missoula soon if it's not already here. We know that everyone has COVID fatigue. We're all tired of hearing it and having to practice all of these prevention measures, but the end is near and the, the end of the pandemic will only come sooner if we continue to use all the tools in our toolbox to stop the virus. So please keep wearing your masks when in public or with people outside of your immediate household. Wash your hands frequently, practice safe social distancing, and please get tested if you begin to experience any symptoms of COVID-19. So that's it for today. As always, you can subscribe to me on YouTube under my name, Cindy Farr, that's C-I-N-D-Y-F-A-R-R. -R. Click the notification bell so you get notified when additional videos are uploaded. Um, you can check out our webpage at missoulainfo.com for lots of great information there. Um, if you are interested in trying to find out where you can schedule a vaccine appointment, you can check out covid19.missoula.co and there's lots of information there about um, which places are having clinics for, for vaccination appointments. Um, follow us on Facebook at the Missoula City County Health Department Facebook page and you can call 258-INFO um, to help for help getting scheduled for a vaccine once the clinic appointments open up. If you don't have internet access, you can also call 258-INFO if you would like to schedule a test for COVID-19 or if you just have general questions about COVID. Um, so until next week, everybody stay healthy. Okay, well, I did definitely talk a lot in this episode, and I'm not going to leave you uh, guys uh, too long on talking about it. I already gave you kind of the news on MCAT. Um, we're basically waiting on getting vaccinated uh, in terms of the library staff, myself included, um, um, in terms of getting vaccines before we can open to the public. I'm assuming they probably have limited hours. They're not too clear on what's, what they're doing with that, but for right now, it, the... Uh, biggest line to cross is getting everyone of the library staff vaccinated. So now they just got to organize how and when they're going to do it. All right. So that's kind of what's happening with that. It's probably going to take, cause you know, with the vaccination, it's like the first shot and then you have to wait like three weeks for the second shot. And then that's pretty much kind of like where we're at right now. So we haven't, I haven't, I can attest that I haven't got my shot yet. So uh, you, you can expect probably, I don't know. I, pro I, I can probably think that my shot will probably happen next month at the earliest, and then it'll be another, another thing with it and whatnot. So I'm honestly, I don't want to get anyone hopes up. And I, I like, I, I keep on <laughs> even telling my boss and people at the library who are just like, just tell me the day before I have to go to work and then I'll go. Boom. Done. It solves the problem. I'm, I'm pretty flexible when it comes to that. But um, that's kind of what's going on with that. I'm really excited for this weekend. If you guys are interested in learning more about our live streams and uh, broadcasts, you can log on to MCAT.org for all that and more. But I'm pretty much done for my show, and I wanted to thank you guys for joining me and for Wake Up Missoula. I'm Scott Ramp. Thank you.